Welcome to Verbal Advantage, the finest vocabulary building program available today. By the time you finish listening to Verbal Advantage, you will have more than tripled your normal rate of learning vocabulary. And when you have mastered all the words in the program, your vocabulary level will be in the top 5% of all educated adults. And that's not all. You will also know how to avoid common errors of grammar, usage, and pronunciation. And you will possess the tools to continue building your verbal skills on your own for the rest of your life. My name is Charles Harrington Elster. For the next several hours, I will be your personal guide on a tour of the English language, a tour that I guarantee will help you improve your word power dramatically and permanently. Along the way, I will also coach you in how to use the language with greater clarity, precision, and style. I think you'll enjoy this tour because to benefit from it, all you have to do is listen. I have arranged the keywords in the program in order of difficulty. As you proceed, you gradually absorb more and more challenging information and continue to expand the boundary of your vocabulary. Level 6 begins at about the 75th percentile of the English vocabulary. When you have mastered all the words through level 8, your vocabulary will equal or exceed that of most executives and professionals, including those with advanced degrees. And when you complete the 10th and final level, you will have progressed beyond 95% of the entire population. You will command an armory of words that only a handful of people in every thousand can match. That's terrific, you're thinking, but another voice inside you may be wondering, why do I need to know all these difficult, unusual words? What good are they to me if 85 or 95% of the population doesn't understand them? Possessing a large and exact vocabulary is pleasurable and reassuring for the same reason that it's pleasurable and reassuring to have money in the bank. It's there when you need it, and you can rest easy that you'll never have to ask for a handout. To take that analogy one step further, if words are like dollars, would you rather live on a tight budget, watching every nickel and dime and worrying about where the next dollar's coming from, or would you rather have a wallet full of words in all denominations that you can spend at your discretion? Many of the words you will learn in Verbal Advantage are not ones you are likely to need every day, and the keywords in levels 9 and 10 are so advanced that you probably will use them only once in a great while. In frequency of use, however, is not always a fair measure of a word's utility. In figure skating, the triple lutz is an extremely difficult maneuver, not often performed, but when a skater successfully accomplishes that jump, it is the crowning moment of the program. The same can be said of adding challenging and unusual words to your verbal repertoire. You may not use them often, but when the need arises, you know that you can call upon them with confidence to provide an appropriate and even spectacular effect. Before we begin the keyword discussions for Level 6, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about how vocabulary is acquired. Children, much more than adults, have a natural ability for learning language. They are biologically programmed to pick up words, concepts, and impressions at a rapid rate. Because of their receptivity to language, children, and particularly preschoolers, can easily learn a second and even a third language. All youngsters have this remarkable talent. The problem begins when the child goes to school and the so-called process of socialization begins. Then one language dominates, and the other, unless it is cultivated at home or in school, is gradually forgotten. There is a lesson to be learned from this about language acquisition and development. When you are a child, you learn hundreds, even thousands of words each year. Some experts say young children can learn more than 5,000 words a year. At a tender age, nearly every word is new, and the mind absorbs them all like a sponge. As you learn to read, you come across scores of new words that express more complex ideas and subtle shades of thought. By the time you finish high school, however, you have learned most of the words you know today, and the rate at which your vocabulary increases has slowed to only about one or perhaps 200 words a year. In college, your vocabulary continues to grow, 
but at this slower rate. Many of the words you learn in college are more common in writing than in speech, and in your academic writing you refine your ability to use them. In graduate or professional school, vocabulary growth becomes even more restricted and specialized, for at that point you are no longer exposed to words from a variety of disciplines, but are instead focusing your attention on words related to a specific field, such as law, medicine, psychology, or economics. In our professional lives, most of our reading and writing is confined to the workplace, where the problem usually is not how to improve the quality and clarity of our communication, but how to get it all done and out the door on time. Let's face it, most people have time to read only what is required in the day-to-day -day performance of the job, and much of that material, I'm sorry to say, is badly written, overwritten, and dull. There's precious little continuing education to be found in a quarterly report, a sales contract, a standard business letter, or a department memorandum. Simply put, what you read, write, and hear at work probably won't do much to improve your vocabulary. To make matters worse, the average college-educated American reads only two books a year. Judging by what sells in the publishing world, I'd wager that those two books are either how-to manuals or popular fiction. That kind of material may provide some relief from the daily grind, or some advice on how not to get pulverized in the daily grind. It will do little or nothing for your vocabulary. Not only that, it may actually be deleterious, for many of today's bestsellers and mass-market books are often so poorly written and edited that they may only reinforce certain bad language habits you have picked up over the years and encourage you to become lazy about learning new words. Thus, environment tends to confine our attention to familiar words and second-rate writing, and circumstance makes it difficult to do much serious reading outside the job. Consequently, our vocabulary growth rate slows way down because we are rarely exposed to new words. And because we are no longer actively using many of the words we learned in school, we start to forget some of them. As the British novelist Evelyn Waugh once wrote, one forgets words as one forgets names. One's vocabulary needs constant fertilization, or it will die. Yes, sad to say, you can indeed forget words you once knew. What happens is this. Gradually, as you grow older, certain words you learned when you were younger begin to drop out of your active vocabulary and enter your passive vocabulary. By active vocabulary, I mean the words you are able to call upon from memory to use in conversation or in writing. Your passive vocabulary is your warehouse of inactive words, which includes the words that are just on the tip of your tongue, as well as those you know you've seen or heard before but can't quite remember. This disappearing process does not affect your everyday vocabulary. You will not forget the meaning of food, clothing, and shelter. The words you lose will be the ones in your passive vocabulary and the ones at the threshold or boundary of your active vocabulary. The good news is that, unlike your physical abilities, which begin to decline in your 30s and 40s, research has shown that your vocabulary can and does continue to grow throughout your life. The bad news is that the growth usually is so slow and gradual that it is hardly noticeable only a trickle of new words each year. In short, once you are out of school, your vocabulary growth rate, which was so rapid in the early part of your life, becomes slow, unremarkable, and at times even stagnant. Clearly such sluggish verbal development is unlikely to improve your chances of success or have any lasting influence on your career. Therefore, if you are convinced, as I am, that vocabulary level is an important factor in determining career satisfaction and personal success, then you must make a concerted effort to seek out and learn new words, beginning with verbal advantage and continuing throughout the rest of your life. If you strive conscientiously to build your knowledge of words, you can double and even triple your normal vocabulary growth rate, add countless words to your active vocabulary, and rescue from oblivion words that have slipped into your passive vocabulary. 
All it takes is a modicum of commitment and self-discipline, just a little bit of effort every day toward the goal. The process is not unlike exercising the muscles of your body to retard the aging process and maintain optimum physical ability for your age. The brain is, after all, like a muscle, the one that commands the whole organism. It, too, needs exercise and nourishment to function at its peak. And that nourishment must be in the form of words and ideas. I have designed Verbal Advantage to help you preserve the words you are in danger of losing, teach you many more new ones, and show you how best to use those words to express your ideas. So, are you ready to begin your ascent to the acme of verbal facility? Here are the first 10 keywords in level 6. Word 1. Ledger Domain. L-E-G-E-R-D-E-M-A-I-N. Sleight of Hand. A cleverly executed trick or deception. In a general sense, the simple word magic is a synonym of ledger domain. More challenging synonyms of ledger domain include prestidigitation and thaumaturgy, which I'll discuss in a moment after I tell you about the expression sleight of hand. The word sleight, spelled S-L-E-I-G-H-T, is related to the word sly, and sleight of hand means literally slyness of the hand a clever trick or illusion done with the hands. The words ledger domain, prestidigitation, and thaumaturgy all refer to magic or deception, but each word has a more specific and precise meaning. Thaumaturgy is spelled T-H-A-U-M-A-T-U-R-G-Y. Thaumaturgy comes from the Greek word for miracle, and by derivation means the working of miracles. Prestidigitation is spelled P-R-E-S-T-I-D-I-G-I-T-A-T-I-O-N. The presti in prestidigitation comes ultimately from the Italian presto, meaning nimble, quick. The digit in the middle of prestidigitation is the word digit, which in one of its senses means a finger, by derivation, prestidigitation is nimbleness with the fingers, quick-fingeredness. Prestidigitation is used as a general synonym for ledger domain, sleight of hand, but sometimes it refers specifically to the art of juggling. Ledger domain comes from a Middle French phrase meaning light of hand. Today, the word may refer specifically to adroitness with the hands, as in performing magic tricks or to any display of clever skill and adroitness. For example, a surgeon, a musician, or an athlete all may display ledger domain. In current usage, ledger domain may also denote a cleverly executed trick or deception. Larry hired a sleazy accountant who promised he could outwit the IRS by performing financial ledger domain. The first lesson of politics is watch out for dirty tricks and other unscrupulous forms of ledger domain. When you spell the word ledger domain, remember that it does not have an E at the end. Word 2. Pural. P-U-E-R-I-L-E. -E. Childish. Immature. Hence, foolish. Silly. Pural comes through the Latin puerilis, meaning youthful, childish, from puer, a child. Synonyms of pural in the sense of childish or immature include infantile and juvenile. Synonyms of pural in the sense of foolish or silly include inane, I-N-A-N-E, -E, frivolous, asinine, fatuous, sophomoric, and callow, word 30 of level 4. The words infantile, juvenile, and pural all may be used in a general way to mean pertaining to childhood. Specifically, however, infantile means pertaining to infancy, to babyhood or very early childhood. Pural means pertaining to the childhood years, the time between infancy and puberty. 
and juvenile means pertaining to pre-adulthood, the teenage years. You can see the words used in this specific way in the phrases infantile paralysis, juvenile court, and pural respiration, which is a respiratory murmur heard in healthy children that in adults is considered a sign of disease. These three words may also be used in a general sense to mean childish, immature, foolish, characteristic of youth. In this sense, juvenile is the least negative. Pural implies harsher judgment. And infantile is the strongest, suggesting the most disagreeable characteristics of childhood, extreme silliness and immaturity. For example, juvenile desires may be simply youthful desires, childlike thoughts in an older head. Pural behavior is childish and inappropriate behavior, unbecoming of one's years. It may refer to children who act younger than they are, and it may only be temporary. Infantile behavior, however, is extremely childish, and an infantile remark is foolish and stupid. Pural has two corresponding nouns, puralism and puerility. Puralism is a psychiatric term for the abnormal appearance of childish behavior in an adult. In my considered but medically unsubstantiated opinion, puralism is the chief occupational disorder of writers and actors. The word puerility may be used in a general sense to mean childishness, immaturity. In civil law, puerility refers to the status of a child between infancy and puberty. Between puberty and the established legal age of maturity, the child is a juvenile. Word 3. Complicity. C-O-M-P-L-I-C-I-T-Y. Conspiracy. Partnership in wrongdoing. Criminal participation. Direct association in guilt. The state of being an accomplice. The words conspiracy, confederacy, collusion, and complicity all refer to partnership or participation in disreputable or illegal activities. Conspiracy means the act of plotting and cooperating secretly, especially to achieve an unlawful, evil, or treacherous purpose, as a conspiracy to commit murder. Confederacy refers to people, groups, states, or nations united for a common purpose. It may be used neutrally to mean simply an alliance, as OPEC is a confederacy of Middle Eastern oil exporting countries. Quite often, however, confederacy is used in a negative sense to mean an alliance in wrongdoing, as a confederacy of terrorists bent on overthrowing the government. A collusion is a specific type of conspiracy, a secret understanding in which one person or group plays into another's hands with the aim of defrauding a third party. For example, if witnesses in a legal trial or parties to a negotiation are in collusion, they are cooperating secretly while appearing to be adversaries. Here it seems appropriate to digress for a moment to discuss the noun connivance and the verb to connive, which today are often used interchangeably with collusion and the verb to collude. Strictly and traditionally, however, these words are not synonymous. Connivance and connive come from the Latin coniwere, to wink at, and by derivation suggest the act of winking at wrongdoing. Originally, and in my opinion properly, to connive is not to conspire or cooperate secretly in an unlawful act, but to wink at it, to pretend not to see it or know about it, and so give tacit consent or encouragement. They bribed the doorman so he would connive at the burglary. The police department connived at organized crime in the city. In like manner, the word connivance properly means the act of conniving, feigning ignorance of wrongdoing. 
illegal gambling would not exist in this town without the connivance of the authorities. When investigators exposed the plot to embezzle company funds, they accused the vice president of connivance. I should point out here that my opinion of how connive and connivance should be used is puristic and, to a certain extent, wishful thinking. All current dictionaries countenance scheme, plot, and conspire as synonyms of connive and sanction conspiracy as a synonym of collusion. My point in raising this issue is not so much to condemn a minor implosion of language as it is to make you aware of the traditional definitions of connive and connivance, which current dictionaries also countenance, but which you may not have known until now. My simple, earnest hope is not to prevent you or anyone else from using connive to mean to plot or conspire, but only that you will learn and remember its other, original meaning, to feign ignorance of wrongdoing. And now back to our key word, complicity. Complicity comes from the Latin complicare, to fold up or fold together. The source also of the words complicate, which means literally to fold or twist together, and accomplice, which means literally a person who is folded up and therefore involved. Whereas the word connivance suggests passive cooperation in something unlawful, complicity denotes active participation or partnership in wrongdoing, the state of being an accomplice. When charged with conspiracy, the defendant professed his innocence and denied any complicity in the plot. Word 4. Transmute. T-R-A-N-S-M-U-T-E. To transform. Specifically, to change from one nature, form, or substance into another, especially to a higher, better, or more refined one. The verb transmute combines the prefix trans, meaning across or beyond, with the Latin mutare, to change. Literally, transmute means to change across the board, or to change something beyond what it is. Transmute was once used in the primitive science of alchemy, which preceded modern chemistry, to refer to the changing of base metals or common elements into a higher form as to transmute iron into gold. Today the word is used generally to mean to completely change the nature or substance of something, especially to change it to a more refined or more desirable state. You can transmute an idea into a reality, transmute sorrow into joy, or make a modest investment that over 30 years transmutes into a substantial nest egg for retirement. Word 5. Abstruse. A-B-S-T-R-U-S-E. Difficult to understand. Hard to grasp mentally. Deep. Profound. Incomprehensible. Unfathomable. Antonyms of abstruse include manifest, discernible, word 32 of level 3, lucid, Word 45 of Level 4, and Perspicuous. Challenging synonyms of abstruse include inscrutable, Word 48 of Level 3, esoteric, Word 29 of Level 5, and also occult, cryptic, enigmatic, arcane, recondite, and acroamatic. Let's take a closer look at a few of those rather abstruse synonyms, all of which apply to things that are secret and mysterious or difficult to understand. By derivation, esoteric means understood by a select group, intended only for the knowledge of a few. Hence, secret, confidential, or beyond most people's knowledge or understanding. The word occult spelled O-C-C-U-L-T, by derivation means hidden or concealed. Today, occult may be used either of that which is secret because it is hidden from view, 
or that which is secret because it is mysterious or incomprehensible. The word cryptic, spelled C-R-Y-P-T-I-C, comes from the Greek kryptos, hidden, which comes in turn from the verb kryptain, to hide. The familiar word crypt comes from the same source and means a burial chamber hidden underground. In modern usage, cryptic applies to that which has a hidden meaning. Cryptic ideas are mystifying ideas. A cryptic message is an incomprehensible or coded message. The noun enigma, spelled E-N-I-G-M-A, and the adjective enigmatic, spelled like enigma with T-I-C at the end, come from a Greek verb meaning to speak in riddles. An enigma is something or someone like a riddle a mystery, puzzle. Enigmatic means like an enigma, and therefore perplexing, puzzling, ambiguous, or incomprehensible. Enigmatic is perhaps most often used of something written or stated, but the word may also apply to actions and to people. The word arcane, spelled A-R-C-A-N-E, comes from the Latin arcana, meaning shut, closed or secret, and ultimately from arca, a box or chest, especially a money chest. By derivation, arcane means shut or closed up, and like esoteric, arcane is now used of that which is known only to a few people. The word usually applies to knowledge or information, as an arcane theory. The word recondite comes from the Latin recondere, to put away, conceal. In modern usage, recondite applies to that which is beyond the grasp of the ordinary person. To most people, for example, particle physics is a recondite subject. Acroamatic, spelled A-C-R-O-A-M-A-T-I-C, is an unusual and abstruse synonym of esoteric. Historically, Acroamatic applies to certain writings by the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle that were addressed to his disciples as opposed to his exoteric writings, which were intended for a popular audience. In a general sense, acroamatic may refer to that which is esoteric, intended for and understood by a select group, recondite, beyond the grasp of the average person, and abstruse, extremely hard to understand. By derivation, abstruse means put or pushed away, and today the word connotes that which has been pushed out of the realm of comprehension. Scholars and scientists are fond of using abstruse academic jargon to discuss abstruse subjects and ideas. Word 6. Edify. E-D-I-F-Y. To instruct. Improve. Teach. Enlighten especially to instruct or improve intellectually, morally, or spiritually. Anything that improves the mind, the character, or the spirit can be described as edifying. If you find an experience instructive, eye-opening, or uplifting, you can say that it edified you or that you found it edifying. You can be edified by a movie, a play, a book, a conversation, by traveling, or by working on an interesting project. As I noted in the first half of the program, if you want to learn more about the world and learn more words, then reading is the best way to edify yourself. But even entertainment can be edifying, although some forms of entertainment, such as watching reruns of Wheel of Fortune, probably won't edify you at all. The corresponding noun is edification, which means enlightenment, intellectual, moral, or spiritual improvement. Public libraries exist for the benefit and edification of all people. He was a philanthropist devoted not only to the material betterment of less fortunate members of society, but also to their edification. Word 7. Supercilious. 
S U P E R C I L I O U S. Haughty, proud, scornful, contemptuous, disdainful. Supercilious comes from the Latin super, meaning over, above, and cilium, eyebrow. By derivation, it means with raised eyebrows, and therefore proud, haughty, disdainful. Supercilious suggests the proud, contemptuous attitude or expression of someone who thinks he's superior and who looks down at others with scorn. Lucy's new supervisor had seemed quite amiable in her interview, but to her dismay, she soon found out he had a supercilious way of assigning her a project and then telling her, If I were you, I'd do it like this. Word 8 Dissemble. D I S. S E M B L E. To disguise. Conceal under a false appearance. Speak or behave hypocritically. Cover up the facts or one's true feelings or motives. Mask under a pretense or deceptive manner. Synonyms of dissemble include to feign, affect, simulate, camouflage, equivocate, and prevaricate. To disguise is the general word meaning to give something a false appearance so it won't be recognized. We disguise our physical appearance, disguise facts, or disguise intentions. To feign, spelled F-E-I-G-N, means to represent falsely, pretend that something exists or is real, as to feign interest, feign illness, feign innocence, or feign sleep. To affect, spelled A-F-F-E-C-T, means to put on a false appearance to make a certain impression, as to affect knowledge, affect a cultivated pronunciation, affect social superiority, or affect a carefree manner when your heart is breaking. Our keyword, dissemble, comes from an old French verb meaning to appear different, and by derivation means to make something appear different from what it is. When you dissemble the facts or dissemble your feelings, you conceal them under a false appearance. The person who dissembles speaks or behaves hypocritically so as to cover up the truth. Word 9. Vacuous. V-A-C-U-O-U-S. Empty, vacant, devoid of substance, interest, intelligence, expression, or meaning. Synonyms of vacuous include blank, unintelligent, shallow, stupid, senseless, inane, and fatuous. The corresponding noun is vacuity, emptiness, an absence of matter or intellectual content. Vacuous comes from the Latin vacuus, empty. In modern usage, vacuous is not used where the words empty or vacant would be appropriate. An empty box or a vacant apartment cannot be described as vacuous. Vacuous usually applies to a figurative lack of content, meaning, or interest. We speak of vacuous eyes, a vacuous discussion, a va Word 10. Capacious. C A P A C I O U S. Roomy, spacious, ample, able to contain or hold a great deal. Capacious may be used either literally or figuratively. When used literally, it is a synonym of spacious and roomy. A capacious house, their capacious office an overcoat with capacious pockets. When used figuratively, it is a synonym of broad and comprehensive, a capacious intellect, a capacious embrace, a capacious view, a capacious treatment of a subject. 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 Subject.
Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned. Listen carefully to the following questions. After each one, decide whether the correct answer is yes or no. Could the takeover of a company by another company be described as a feat of corporate ledger domain? Yes, it could if the takeover was accomplished in a clever, tricky way. Ledger domain means sleight of hand, a cleverly executed trick or deception. Is a puerile remark likely to be taken seriously? No. A puerile remark is childish, immature, and therefore foolish, silly. If three people are involved in a crime, could one be charged with the crime and the other two with complicity? Yes, complicity means conspiracy, partnership in wrongdoing, the state of being an accomplice. Can you transmute a thought into words? Yes, to transmute means to transform, to change from one state or form into another, especially a more refined or more desirable one. Is abstruse writing clear and easy to understand? No, something abstruse is difficult to understand, hard to grasp mentally, incomprehensible, unfathomable. Can eating well and getting enough sleep edify you? No, eating and sleeping well may make you healthy, but good health won't edify you. To edify means to instruct or improve intellectually, morally, or spiritually. Could a supercilious gesture also be described as puerile? No. Puerile means childish or foolish. Supercilious means haughty, scornful, contemptuous. If you dissemble the truth, do you explain or reveal it? No, you cover it up or disguise it. To dissemble means to conceal under a false appearance, speak or behave hypocritically. Is a vacuous look an interested or intense look? No, a vacuous look is a blank or vacant look. Vacuous means empty, devoid of substance, interest, or meaning. Can a capacious room and a capacious memory both hold many things? Yes. Word 11. Mnemonic. M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C. Helping or pertaining to the memory. Assisting or improving the ability to recall. The odd spelling of mnemonic, with its initial M-N, comes from Greek. Ultimately, mnemonic comes from a Greek verb meaning to remember, and by derivation means mindful. In Greek mythology, there is a goddess called Mnemosyne, spelled capital M-N-E-M, O-S-Y-N-E. Mnemosyne was the goddess of memory and the mother of the nine muses who preside over literature, the arts, and the sciences. The adjective mnemonic means assisting or pertaining to the memory. A mnemonic device is a memory aid, something that helps one to remember. For example, the old rhyme, 30 days hath September, April, June, and November, is a mnemonic device for remembering the number of days in a given month. The term mnemonics refers to any technique or system for improving the memory. Word 12. Sonorous. S-O-N-O-R-O-U-S. Resonant. Deep, full, and rich in sound. Having or capable of producing a powerful, impressive sound. A sonorous voice. A sonorous speaker. The sonorous bells of a cathedral. You may have heard this word pronounced sonorous, with the accent on the first syllable instead of the second. Sonorous is originally a British pronunciation, which in the mid-1900s gradually began making its way into American speech. The traditional American pronunciation is sonorous.
When it comes to American versus British pronunciation, my policy is that British speakers should use British pronunciations and American speakers should use American pronunciations. Perhaps indicating agreement with that dictum, the top four current American dictionaries all list sonorous first. Word 13. Admonish. A-D-M-O-N-I-S-H. To warn or notify of a fault or error, especially in conduct or attitude. To criticize or reprove gently but earnestly. Synonyms of admonish include advise, counsel, caution, apprise, exhort, and expostulate. The corresponding noun is admonishment, a gentle warning or mild criticism. To admonish comes from the Latin verb admonere, to warn, remind. The word suggests putting someone in mind of something he has forgotten, done wrong, or disregarded by giving him a strong but gently expressed warning or reminder. You can admonish an employee for tardiness or for overlooking an error. You can admonish a small child, word 14. Paradigm. P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. An example, model, or pattern. Paradigm, which gets its unusual spelling from Greek, is used of an example that serves to illustrate or explain something or that serves as a model or pattern. Scholars develop paradigms for their theories. A novel may be a paradigm of contemporary morality. An important experience can serve as a paradigm for evaluating later experiences. And the successful strategy of one corporation may be the paradigm for another corporation's plan to restructure itself and redefine its goals. The corresponding adjective is paradigmatic, which means exemplary, typical, serving as a model or pattern. Paradigm is the traditional American pronunciation. The alternative pronunciation, paradigm, now preferred by many educated speakers, is originally British. Both pronunciations are countenanced by word 15. Circuitous. C-I-R-C-U-I-T-O-U-S. Roundabout. Indirect. Not straightforward. Following a roundabout and often extended course. Challenging synonyms of circuitous include devious, meandering, sinuous, tortuous, serpentine, which may also be pronounced serpentine, and labyrinthine, which means like a labyrinth or maze. The adjective circuitous is formed by adding the suffix ous to the familiar noun circuit. A circuit is a line or route that goes around and returns to where it started. Literally, circuitous means like a circuit, going around, following a roundabout and often lengthy course. They took a circuitous route to avoid traffic. His argument, word 16. Vindicate. V-I-N-D-I-C-A-T-E. To clear from blame free from suspicion of wrongdoing or dishonor. Uphold or maintain the truth or innocence of something or someone in the face of criticism or imputations of guilt. If you are accused of something but later the charge is dropped, then you have been vindicated. You can vindicate your good name or your reputation by clearing it from blame or suspicion. You can also vindicate a claim of ownership or your right to something by defending or upholding the truth of it. The corresponding noun is vindication. In a civil lawsuit, the plaintiff seeks restitution for an alleged wrong, and the defendant seeks vindication from the charges. To vindicate, to exonerate, and to acquit all mean to free from blame. Acquit refers specifically to a judicial decision to release someone from a charge. 
Exonerate implies removing the burden of guilt for a wrongdoing that may or may not have been committed. Vindicate means to clear from blame, criticism, or suspicion of guilt by bringing forth evidence and proving the unfairness of the charge. Someone may Word 17. Bucolic. B-U-C-O-L-I-C. Rural. Rustic. Of or pertaining to country life. Synonyms of bucolic include pastoral, provincial, agrarian, idyllic, I-D-Y-L-L-I-C, and Arcadian. Antonyms include urban, municipal, civic, metropolitan, and cosmopolitan. Bucolic comes from Latin and Greek words meaning a herdsman, shepherd, which in turn come from the Greek bous, an ox. Bucolic may mean either pastoral, pertaining to shepherds, or rustic, pertaining to farming and country life. Bucolic poetry is poetry about the country or country folk. Bucolic scenery is rural or rustic scenery. Sometimes bucolic is used word 18. Ostracize. O-S-T-R-A-C-I-Z-E. To banish, send into exile, expel from a place. To bar, exclude, or reject from a group or from acceptance by society. His questionable conduct led to his being ostracized by the other members of his profession. After the embarrassing incident, her friends began to avoid her, and eventually they ostracized her from their social life. The verb to ostracize, the corresponding noun ostracism, and the related word petalism, spelled P-E-T-A-L-I-S-M, share an interesting history. Ostracism and petalism were forms of banishment employed by the ancient Greeks. Ostracize and ostracism come from the Greek ostrakon, a potsherd, a piece of broken pottery. Ostracism was practiced by the ancient Athenians as a way of removing from the city people considered dangerous or embarrassing to the state. Citizens would vote by writing the name of the person to be expelled on a potsherd or earthenware tablet. Banishment was for a period of ten years, after which time the person was considered vindicated and free to return. Petalism was a similar mode of expulsion practiced in ancient Syracuse. Petalism differed from ostracism only in the method of voting, which was done by writing on an olive leaf instead of on a piece of clay, and in the length of the exile, which was for five instead of ten years. The Century Dictionary notes that pedalism was a va- word 19. Plethora. P-L-E-T-H-O-R-A. An excess. Surplus. Overabundance. Oversupply. Synonyms of plethora include superabundance, profusion, superfluity, and surfeit. S-U-R-F-E-I-T. Antonyms of plethora include scarcity, insufficiency, dearth, word 12 of level 3, and paucity. The worst kind of boss is the one who offers a plethora of advice and a paucity of assistance. Plethora comes from the Greek plethane, to be full. In medicine, the word is used to mean an excess of blood in the body. In general usage, plethora may refer to any excess, surplus, or overabundance. This report contains a plethora of dull statistics. Throughout her career, she was blessed with a plethora of opportunities. American consumers no longer give the bulk of their business to small, specialized retailers, but instead prefer to shop at superstores that offer a plethora of merchandise at discount prices. Plethora is the noun. The corresponding adjective is plethoric. A plethoric harvest is an overabundant harvest, a bumper crop. 
Plethoric wealth is excessive wealth. Plethoric writing is verbose, inflated writing. It overflows with words or puffed-up self-importance. When used of language, word 20. Proclivity. P-R-O-C-L-I-V-I-T-Y. An inclination. Liking. Leaning. A strong, natural bent or tendency often toward something disagreeable, objectionable, or wicked. Synonyms of proclivity include partiality, penchant, word 9 of level 3, predisposition, predilection, and propensity. By derivation, proclivity means a sloping forward or downward, hence a leaning, tendency, or inclination. In current usage, the word may have a neutral connotation, as a proclivity to study, a proclivity for music. More often, however, the word propensity is used in this neutral sense, and proclivity usually suggests a strong natural bent or inclination toward something bad or wrong. For example, a person may have a proclivity for drinking or gambling, a proclivity to lie, or antisocial proclivities. Livities, 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 livities. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned. Listen carefully to the following statements and decide whether each one is true or false. A mnemonic device helps you remember something. True. Mnemonic means helping or pertaining to the memory, assisting or improving the ability to recall. The squeak of a mouse or the squeal of a pig is a sonorous noise. False. Sonorous means resonant, deep, full, and rich in sound, having or capable of producing a powerful, impressive sound. It's illegal to admonish a child. False. Parents admonish their children all the time, and it's perfectly legal. To admonish means to warn or notify of a fault or error, especially in conduct or attitude to criticize or reprove gently but earnestly. The United States has served as a paradigm for many later democracies. True. A paradigm is an example, model, or pattern. When you take a circuitous route, you proceed in a roundabout manner. True. Circuitous means roundabout indirect, not straightforward. A person who feels vindicated feels wrongfully blamed for something. False. To vindicate means to clear from blame, free from suspicion of wrongdoing or dishonor. A bucolic lifestyle is an unwholesome lifestyle. False. Bucolic means rural, rustic, of or pertaining to country life. Most people would consider it a great honor to be ostracized. False. Being ostracized is no fun. To ostracize means to banish, send into exile, exclude or reject from a group or from acceptance by society. When you have a plethora of food, you don't have enough. False. Plethora means an excess, surplus, overabundance, oversupply. Some people's proclivities are difficult to tolerate. True. A proclivity is an inclination, a strong natural